What a wonderful morning of worship. I just really, um, I was just really worshiping today with those uh, beautiful praise songs. And, um, and then I just, um, just love Donna's testimony about how we can get involved uh, beyond Sunday morning and whatever your ministry may be. And, and uh, it's just been a wonderful time to worship God today. And I would also encourage you, we, we've got some things to go deeper as we worship and, and as we love our God. And um, one of those is a prayer. We're really going to, we really want to become a praying congregation. And we, we have the prayer room set up. Thank you, Rosemary, for helping with that. And also, beginning in June on Sunday evenings, what a great way to, to get out from the the boredom of Sunday, if you're just bored at home and you've got your nap in, and uh, come and get some excitement back in your life. Rosemary's going to have a, uh, a lesson on prayer, and it's going to begin in June. I think that goes about 10 weeks, about 10 weeks, 11 weeks. Okay, you get one extra week, and it's free. And uh, come, uh, we're going to, uh, you know, kind of explore new methods of prayer and what prayer means. I'm going to begin at 830 prayer small group uh, coming up in a few weeks, and then on Wednesday nights to carry on our worship as well. Come on Wednesday nights at 7, and uh, this summer we're going to look at sharing our faith, sharing Jesus without freaking out, and I think we all need to, we need to talk about that. Uh, so some wonderful things coming up. Just talk, Tony, I'm not going to put you on the spot, you don't got to say anything. Tony and I talked this morning, uh, June 3rd, two weeks from today, Tony's going to be baptized uh, here at our 930 service, amen? So if you uh, know of some others that are really uh, making that decision for Christ or that they, you know, they just need to be nudged some, share your faith with them and encourage them to be, to be baptized as well. Well, Donna read from, from Mark this, uh, this little story again of Jesus and and it really brings out some very important themes and ideas. Don't worry, I'm not going to call you Pharisees this, <clears throat> this Sunday. Um, I, I might infer maybe you're a lunatic or a liar, but not, not Pharisees. But, you know, for all of us, the holy means or the holy ways of God are, are very mysterious to us. And they should be. God is God and, and, and we are men and women. And we know God is constantly moving in our world. God is constantly moving in our lives. And, and many times we just either do not recognize him or we just refuse to surrender to his promptings. And for some uh, people, we just cannot accept that God will move in certain ways or use circumstances in our lives to let us know who we are or to convict us or we don't even believe that he's real at all. And when these times of ignoring God, when these times of doubting the reality of God happen, that's when I think we as, as human beings begin to try to rationalize or develop what I call some very dangerous ideas about Jesus and really why that Jesus came. And this is really what's happening in this passage from Mark that Donna read to you. Jesus has ushered in the very the new kingdom of God. He has brought change in order to show us a, a new way, a final way to acquire a relationship with God. A, a way that moves from just obeying laws to try to have a relationship with God. Two, depending on the grace of God himself. And as the people of Jesus' day tried to digest this new teaching, they're going to respond in different ways. Some are going to just say that he's a lunatic. Others are going to accuse him of being a liar that's from Satan and not really from God. And out of their confusion in their understanding of who Jesus is and why Jesus came, uh, we can be aware that there are some dangerous ideas about Jesus out there right now. Now, I'm kind of speaking to the choir today. Because most of you know Jesus, you love Jesus, but it's important to realize about what 
other people think about Jesus before they call him Lord. And I think we see that in the passages. Now, some people in Jesus' day said Jesus was just a lunatic. Jesus was a lunatic. In the first scene we see this morning in the scripture, we see Jesus coming back to his hometown after a season of ministry. He's been out teaching. He's been out healing. uh, He's been out, as we said, ushering in this new idea. Repent, for the new kingdom of God has come into your midst. And he comes back home. And the people of the town learn he's there. And the house where he is staying, like it seems everywhere Jesus is going these days, becomes very crowded. And amidst this crowd, Jesus' family shows up as well, don't they? His mother his brothers, and they are concerned that all of this attention is going to Jesus' head. Right now, right now in their life, they can only see and know Jesus. They, They remember him as their brother, their son, who's a little boy, who's been a young man, who's learned the carpentry trade, who seems like every other normal Jewish man that, that, uh, that they see around them. Now, Mary should know that, that something's different. Back in the, in the narratives of Jesus' birth, you know, it says that, that Mary has heard from the Holy Spirit. Uh, she knows that, that Jesus has been born within her, a virgin. And the scriptures even say Mary ponders all these things in her heart. And she thinks about these things. But still in this scene we see even Jesus' mother is having a difficult time grasping all that Jesus is saying. And so they wonder, his family, if Jesus is mentally sound and they're almost encouraging him, hey, come away with us. We need to have a little intervention here. Let's get, you out of, let's get you out of this setting. Let's get you out of this crowd. Let's, uh, let's talk about some of the things that you're saying. We're worried about you. <clears throat> they see and hear about Jesus teaching with the authority of God and healing as if he is the Messiah or a great prophet. <clears throat> and they want just to take him home, save him from self-destruction. And we can, we can imagine, if you think about it, look at the audacity of Jesus' claims. And we can understand why his family then and some people now try to explain Jesus away by just saying he was crazy. He was out of his mind. Jesus claims, and just think of somebody in our midst did this. Jesus claims to be the Messiah of the world. Jesus claims to be God's son who is divine. Jesus claims that he is teaching with authority that comes from God. Jesus says he is coming to turn a more than 1,000 year old religion, Judaism, on its head and turn it upside down. That on the surface sounds crazy, doesn't it? Who thinks that they can do that? And many today and in our day, as you are going to share with them in gospel conversations about Jesus, when you talk to them about his salvation, when you talk to them about how he's changed your life, some will come away with the attitude, that just sounds crazy. Has anybody ever said that to you? Anybody ever come across with that? response their argument is that that Jesus well he was just uh, delusional in his opinion about himself they and they look at Christians they look at believers that people that have we've just been sadly misinformed that we just don't and they just don't understand why we have the joy and the satisfaction and the security and the hope that the Christian life brings They cannot get that far in their belief. In many instances, what happens is that a person's logic begins to take over 
And they can't get past that logic for a while. The logic is they begin to ask questions. How can God come in the form of a human? Or they say, does God exist even at all? I've been reading, uh, there are websites out there, and I was trying to read about what people are saying about Jesus these days this week. I mean, <clears throat> there are um, atheist websites out that are promoting, that promote the logic of athe atheism that, that God just doesn't exist at all. And then they'll say, well, tell me, how can someone be raised from the dead? And how can someone be born again? And, you know, these are not current questions. If you read the third chapter of the Gospel of John, Nicodemus has the same questions, doesn't he? On the surface, if we think of it in human terms, it's hard to understand. But we know here, who are believers, Jesus was not a lunatic, was he? Jesus was not delusional. His teachings are considered the most profound the world has ever heard. And if you look up what others think about Jesus, even those that really don't claim to be a believer, many of them still say what Jesus said was profound, and he was real, and he was historical, and he was sane in his right mind. We know that, that Jesus' deep relationship with the Father, the Father God, in the Gospels is so authentic, it's so real, that it's a person who is thinking clearly. Some people say, and even Jesus' own family remember that, that Jesus is a lunatic. Now, we know that at least one of Jesus' brothers, and especially his mother, would become believers after the resurrection, didn't they? Jesus can penetrate that heart. But that belief is out there. Now, the second belief that was pretty prominent in the passage that we read today, some others said, well, <clears throat> he may be sane, but if he's sane, Jesus must be possessed. <laughs> Jesus must be possessed. Jesus must, you know, be associated with the devil, the, the, the father of lies. He must be a liar. And the next scene we see is with the scribes and the, from Jerusalem. And they show up and, and they claim this exact thing. The only way that Christ is able to perform miracles and exorcisms against evil is because Satan is the one working through Jesus. And Jesus refutes their argument by saying that why would Satan fight against himself? That's a pretty good argument. The evil one is just more cunning than that. I'm sure he's been more cunning than that in your own life, hasn't he? When he's tempted you. In other words, Jesus insists that, that one cannot accomplish good by practicing evil. And he doesn't either. Basically this argument is the one today that says. That, that Jesus is, was, was a good man. A moral teacher. But he was just not of God. He wasn't God's son. Yes he was a good teacher. Yes he had great things to say. But he wasn't God's son. And people would argue that. That humanity, that we can really live by our own standards. That we can make the quality of our lives better by our own methods. And living a good moral life is possible with Jesus or without Jesus. But we should strive just to be moral and good folk. But the reality is, when we try to control morality, or when we view it or begin to focus on others and force others to behave as we want them to versus share Jesus with them and let Jesus change them, we begin to fight Satan with Satan. We begin to adopt and actually believe in ourselves and our own ability and our own teaching. And all of a sudden we believe that cruelty be, can be cast out by offering more cruelty. We begin to believe that war can be avoided by more war. We begin to believe that truth can be established 
by telling a few lies and then the truth will come out. We begin to believe that the antidote for violence is more violence. We begin to believe that, that liberty is established by oppression. And in our attempt to save ourselves, we prove Jesus' argument. What did he say again in that 20, beginning with that 24th verse? How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His evil has come. And as long as, as we try to, to stay in control of our life and think we can do it on our own, we're just fighting Satan with Satan. We need to allow Jesus to have control of our life so that the hearts of our house will not be divided. Jesus came so that we can be one. We can be one with the Father as he was one with the Father. And when we're one in spirit with the one who created us, who is love, then evil will be done away with. So some say Jesus was a lunatic. Others say, well, Jesus was just either of the devil or, or just lying. But many arrive, and many of you have arrived, I hope everyone in this room has arrived at the ultimate truth, and that is Jesus is really who he says he was and who says he is. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Jesus' summary of, of these incorrect and false ideas of who he really was is very sobering. The way he says it gives us pause. He says in verse 28, Truly I tell you, people can be forgiven of all of their sins and every slander they utter, but whoever blasphemies against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. He said this because they were saying he has an impure spirit. Jesus reminds us that, that there's ideas about him that are not to be taken lightly. It's not as if accepting Jesus is, is one of the many choices about eternal life. It's not one of the many choices we have to discover the purpose of our existence. What one believes concerning Jesus has eternal consequences. And this statement that Jesus makes about blaspheming the Holy Spirit, boy, that has been confusing to many, hasn't it? <laughs> that has been, you know, what is that? What is that sin that blasphemies the Holy Spirit? And boy, people have come up with this and that and, and the other. I had a friend in college. All I remember his first name was Bruce. And uh, man, one of the most gifted pianists I ever knew. Could, could play, I mean, concert pianist, but also could just play by ear, could play modern, contemporary. He was just a, just a gifted, gifted artist. But Bruce uh, just was always almost on the border or sometimes went into full depression. And I never knew what it was, except he really felt he got this idea in his head that he had blasphemed the Holy Spirit and was doomed for all eternity. And he never could get over that. And he lived in this misery. He believed in Christ. He believed in him for salvation. He loved the Lord. And, and myself and others would try to tell him, Bruce, that's, that's all that matters. But he couldn't get over these rumors now, they were crazy rumors, <laughs> and they were lies of Satan, that he had done something that was unforgivable. And he had a hard, hard life, and I don't think he ever got over that. So what is Jesus speaking to us about? I think he's, I know that he's speaking to us about what the scribes have just done. He's speaking 
uh, to those people then and now who look upon him and cannot and do not believe in him as the Son of God. That's what he's talking about. You see, one of the roles of the Holy Spirit is to convince us, to convict us that Jesus is really who he says he is. The Spirit enables us to see God. So in Jesus, we, we have the truth presented before us. We see him in scripture. We, we hear him in a testimony. We sing about him with beautiful songs that have been written and we sing along with and are performed. But if we continually refuse to allow the Spirit to teach and convict us, our hearts will become hardened. If we continually refuse the guidance of the Spirit, we soon become incapable of recognizing His voice in beautiful music, in a heartfelt testimony, through God's Word. Evil will begin to look good, and, and good will begin to look evil. So what is Jesus talking about? Those who blaspheme the Holy Spirit? He's speaking to the person then and now who has not recognized him as Lord and who has not confessed him and come to repentant faith through him, Jesus, the Son of God. That's what it means to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. The only way, Jesus is saying, the only way for a person not to be forgiven eternally by God is to never ask is to never confess our sin, to never ask for forgiveness through Jesus Christ. But all we have to do is ask. It's that simple. When we hear the gospel preached, we, we should realize that, that realize that Jesus is the perfect, sinless Son of God. We should become aware of our sin and the need for a Savior. That's what the Spirit is telling us. But not listening to the Spirit, shutting our ears and heart to salvation that's found in Jesus Christ is the sin against the Spirit that Jesus speaks to. The only way. Other than that, there is no sin that cannot be forgiven. There is no category of sin. There's no great sin, least sin, any sin. Anyone can be forgiven, restored, redeemed because of what Christ did for us on the cross. The only thing that doesn't work is to ignore it. So what is the truth? Who is Jesus? The truth is Jesus is the Son of God. The truth is Jesus is the Savior of the world. The truth is Jesus is the way to eternal life. That's who Jesus is. Now, this three-way argument of how to view Jesus is found in, in this scripture passage. And it was also discovered and presented by C.S. Lewis. If you've ever read C.S. Lewis. And Lewis expressed his idea more than one place. But one of his most uh, definitive defenses of this theory is in mere Christianity. And, and here's what he says. I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. A lot of people say that. Lewis goes on to say, That is the one thing we must not say. A man who said the sort of things Jesus said would not be just a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he is a poached egg. Or else he would be the devil. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being just a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. 
Jesus didn't come to be a great teacher. Jesus didn't come to be a great healer. Jesus didn't come to revolutionize a, a, a thousand-year-old religion. Jesus came on a rescue mission to rescue you and I from ourselves. And he only can do that because he's God, he is Lord, and he is who he says he is. Do you believe that? It's the eternal question that makes all the difference. That's why Mark put it in here. Because people of his day were struggling with the same thing. I'm going to pray in just a minute. <clears throat> Our praise team is going to come up and we're going to have a, a final song to continue the beautiful worship that we've been experiencing. God's spoken to us in his word and Again, um, I look around, I believe I know all the hearts that are here, but I don't know all of them. But I want to make sure that you believe and know that Jesus is who he says he is. And the only thing that can keep you from that great love and grace is never to accept him. So accept Christ for who he is, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Son of God, the one that can transform your life and forgive you of your sin and allow you to, to sing and praise the living God like all of us here have been doing today. That's the great invitation. I invite you to do that in your heart and, and then please talk to me or, or uh, Willard, uh, Donna, Deacon, anyone. And uh, we'll tell you the next steps. Let's stand as we thank Jesus for who he really is as we sing together.